Sri, Deputy Dean of Student Affairs in Faculty of Education, UKM. She graduated with Bachelor of Education with honors in physics and minor mathematics in the curriculum and pedagogy also from University of Bangsa Malaysia and Doctor of Philosophy in Curriculum and Pedagogy from the Edinburgh University. Dr. Nur Faradila is an expert in curriculum development, culturally responsive pedagogy, self-directed learning, educational equity, education assessment, and qualitative research. She was awarded with a gold medal for Rampai Penyeli Day in 2018, Anugrah Perhimatan Chamalang in 2019, a gold medal in Mysore in 2020, and another gold medal in International Virtual Educational Invention, Innovation and Design Competition in 2020, and another Anugrah Kecemelangan Penyelidikan, also in year 2020. Dr. Nur Faradila has been actively involved in community services since year 2018, and she's also part of COVID-19 Student Relief Program. What a remarkable person is our guest speaker today. Uh, so this will be one amazing experience to be working with you. Yeah, doctor. Hello, doctor. Hi, thank you very much for inviting me. All right, we will uh, start with our sharing session. Okay, so I will pass this session to our lovely doctor. So the floor is yours, doctor. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to Noel, uh, to Vanessa and Frida. So um, a very good morning to everyone. Um, let me have my slides on. Oh, um, but I'm not able to share my screen. So where should I send the, 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 the slide? Okay, Shahe, can you help Dr. Nur Fadila regarding that? And the host have to. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, on the button is share screen. Yeah, but but host is able participant. Oh, okay, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Speaker on. Tidak semua kena muted ni sebenarnya. Okay, ah uh, now I I can share my screen. Thank you. Okay. Mm. Right. So, uh, can you see my slides here? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So we are going to talk about case based learning, and I'm sure that uh, all of you you have some kind of idea about what is case based learning only that we are going to have um, an interactive discussion on what is case-based learning. So let me introduce myself. I am Dr. Nor Faradila Muhammad Nasri. Currently, I am Deputy Dean uh, for Faculty of Education, UKM. So I'm very happy to see uh, my students here. So I have Noel, I have Vanessa. So I welcome anybody that want to pursue their study. Uh, so let's go to, let's come to UKM. Okay, so what is case-based learning? Before we proceed further into what is case-based learning, uh, let us uh, see what is education. What does education mean? Okay, classically, education means uh, refer to a process of receiving giving systematic instruction. So receiving instruction and giving instruction, and it occurs in formal educational institution. So that is a classical definition of um, education, a process of receiving and giving instruction occurs at a school or university. However, that is a very narrow definition of education. What we should, um, what, what education refers today, um, it refers to a continuous learning process that occurs beyond formal education institution. And education has captured um, sustainable development goal where quality education, SDG number four, 
set a goal that we need to ensure an inclusive and equitable quality education that promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. So rather than um, assuming education just as a process of receiving and giving instruction, we have to go beyond as a process of learning throughout the student's life. Okay. However, it is very sad to know that 3.5 million of Malaysian students do not meet the minimum English proficiency. What does this mean? More than 72% of the Malaysian students will enter the workforce at a disadvantage. So they will not be able to perform at their fullest uh, potential. So if they have poor English proficiency, what will happen? Difficulties in learning. Why they will face difficulties in learning? Because they will have very limited access to study materials. Why? Because information uh, is disseminated in English language, mostly. Okay? And they will have limited employability. Why? Because our employers nowadays, they look for those that are fluent in English and they will have less opportunities within the workplace in terms of salary increase and so on. So this means that English is very important. So that is why we need quality English education for our students. Because by having a quality English education, they will have confidence, they will be competent students, they can connect across borders, meaning that they can have a discussion with their other counterparts from all over the world. They will have access, lifetime access to knowledge, and they can improve their quality of life and they will feel empowered. Why? Because they were able to look for information themselves. They can share um, their knowledge with others all around the world, so they will feel empowered. Okay, to set the stage, um, Malaysia was formerly an English colony before gaining independence in 1957. So some of British cultural influences remain, and one of it is the language. Uh, we used to converse in English, okay? And one of the international education firm, EF Education First, has conducted an assessment to test English proficiency among non-native common English countries. And the results are uh, Netherlands scored number one with 70.27, followed by Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. Remarkably, we have Singapore at number fifth with a score of 66.82. And Malaysia is reported to have a high non-native command of English. So what does this mean? What does this mean when we said Malaysia have high non-native command of English? It means that Malaysian um, are able to read English language newspaper, okay, they are able to read the newspaper, they are able to understand a show in English, and they are able to deliver a work presentation in English. That is the meaning of high proficiency level. And um, Malaysia can be proud. Why? Because we are above Hong Kong, India, South Korea, Taiwan, China, Macau, Japan, Pakistan, Indonesia, and Nepal. Uh, we are also above Bangladesh, Maldives, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Mongolia, Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, Cambodia, Uzbekistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan. However, a point to note, this study have some limitation where 
the participant, the self-selection bias. Most of um, our participants from Malaysia, they are from urban area. They are from Selangor and they are younger adults. Okay, so it shows that um, the English proficiency level is concentrated at urban area. Fast forward to 2019, we have English, we have language policy. Memartabatkan bahasa Melayu, memperkasakan bahasa Inggeris. Where we offer parents a dual language program. Uh, and this program continues to gain popularity. Why? Because parents uh, acknowledge the importance of uh, Bahasa Inggeris and the need for their children to master English language. However, despite our effort, despite our strategy to improve English language proficiency, Malaysia Education Blueprint that targeted about 70% of students to pass English with credit by 2025 fail to achieve its objective. Why? Because um, only less than 50% are able um, to pass English with a credit. So that is a very huge gap. Okay, we targeted at 70%, but we get less than 30%. So it is very concerning. It's very it is a worrying situation. So, how can we improve um, English language proficiency? This is a study conducted by Donohoe, Hetty, and Eels in 2018. They found out that um, there are various factors influencing students' achievement. And one of it is collective teacher efficacy. Teachers believe that they are able to teach um, proficiently. Teachers believe that they are competent as an educator. So the effect size is about three times okay, from other factors. We can see that um, collective teacher efficacy, the effect size is 1.57, followed by prior achievement, socioeconomic status, home environment, parental involvement, motivation, concentration, and homework. You can see that homework is the least factors influencing student achievement. That means if you give a lot of homework to the students, it doesn't make any difference. Okay? The most important thing is the teacher itself. The teacher needs to believe that they are the best teachers. Okay. However, uh, Jenkins 2012 reported that students' interest uh, in going to schools decrease as they progress throughout the school level. You can see that at kindergarten, uh, their interest to school is about 95%. However, as they progress throughout the level, it decreases significantly, 37% only. So why is this happening? So we should do something. Why schooling are uh, making the students uh, losing interest in learning? So... This is because uh, we have a very uh, different point of view. The experts, they have their, their own suggestion. The teachers have their own belief that what makes teaching works and the students themselves, they have their own needs. So from the experts point of view, they said, they suggest that effective teaching strategies for English includes demonstration, choral drill, look and say, pictorial and verbal illustration, association, questioning, storytelling, read and say, vocabulary building, writer's workshop, peer response and editing, cooperative learning, being allowed, uh, using various of medium to convey information and to slow down your speech. But, and the list continues. 
However, from the teacher's point of view, what is effective teaching strategies? Okay, they said effective teaching strategies include gestures, visual cues, repetition, using a real object, real props, hands-on materials, multi-sensory approaches. But when it comes to students' point of view, what is it? Is the most important instructional strategies and what is the least important instructional strategies? They said direct teaching is important. Specific informal assessment based on curriculum. So objective assessment is important. Fluency building is important for the students. Aesthetic and phonemic awareness, tactile vocabulary. So that is what important to a student. What they see as less important, they don't like teachers to use book as support. They don't like to act out a story where we say that, where we assume it is very kind of learning, but they said they don't like to act out. Uh, oral sharing and discussion on a topic. So they don't prefer to have oral sharing or to have a discussion. Uh, they don't like to predict what is going on, what is going to happen in a story. And they dislike visualization. So knowing that we have to be very careful in selecting our case. Okay. So what we can synthesize from the experts, from the teachers, as well and as well as from the students' point of view, good English teaching should be active, should be student-centered, be meaningful and engaging. Okay. So now we go to case-based learning. Case-based learning. Uh, has been widely used in various fields and it has been very successful in medical field, in engineering field. But what differs case-based learning from problem-based learning? We know that teachers are very familiar with problem-based learning. They give a problem to the students and the students have to solve the problem themselves. So case-based learning differs from problem-based learning because um, case-based learning is a very guided kind of inquiry compared to problem-based learning. Problem-based learning, students are left to pursue in inquiry, systematic inquiry process. However, in case-based learning, um, they are guided with some props, with some uh, information. Uh, supplied by the teachers. But what they share, similarity, is um, a real-world scenario. And uh, both case-based learning as well as problem-based learning, they promote higher level of cognition. Why? Because in both case-based learning as well as problem-based learning, the students should engage in a very intense discussion. So they have to uh, discuss with their friends in a spoken interaction. So through this interaction, they can improve their English. So case-based learning is a guided inquiry and is grounded in constructivism. Constructivism means that the students themselves construct the knowledge by interacting with their knowledge and the environment. So typically, in case-based learning, we would proceed in a group work. Why? Because we want an interaction to happen. It takes place. And case-based uh, learning is very useful to teach English as um, the students are required to apply linguistic skills in combination with analytical as well as interpersonal skills. Uh, the kind of skills that, need, that we need um, outside the classroom in our real life. Okay. So, uh, what are the, the topics that English teacher can consider when we want to proceed with 
case based learning. So some of the topic that I can suggest is planning a weekend in a specific town, choosing a restaurant suitable for people with different dietary requirements, planning a vacation on a budget for a group of family uh, at a specific destination, advising somebody on how to reduce plastic waste in daily life, advising somebody on how to lead a healthier lifestyle, planning an intercultural party, evaluating a brochure, evaluating apartment rental offers, and you can be creative at creating this case study. Uh, and there are a number of benefits of using CDL, case-based learning in the classroom as it encourages collaborative learning, uh, integration of learning, develop students' intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. How this case-based learning can motivate the students because uh, it links to their real-life situation, uh, encourages learners to be self-reflection, uh, critical reflection, allows scientific inquiry, but in a guided way so that we don't uh, waste uh, too much time on certain case. It integrates knowledge and practice and it supports the development of a variety of learning skills. So when we know uh, case study requires a case to be investigated, uh, to be discussed, and to be solved. So what are the steps? Conduct a case study. First, step number one, the teacher should introduce the situation. They introduce what are the cases that we need um, to investigate further. Okay, introduce a relevant vocabulary. So this is where students will learn um, English language in terms of improving their vocabulary, uh, comprehension, and so on. Step number two. So everyone should read the case study and analyze the additional materials. Who should supply these additional materials? So it is the teacher, as it is a guided inquiry process. Okay. Number three, students should discuss possible solution in small groups. Why we should have a small group? Uh, a small group of four to five um, students is the best. Okay. More than that, uh, then we will have uh, a free ride, a free rider. But if less, we are not able to encourage interactive discussion. So uh, the rule of thumb is four to five is the best for small groups. Okay, so now step one, step two, step three. Step four is the for the students to present and justify their solutions. Step five, uh, everybody should participate in a feedback. So giving feedback to the students presentation and solutions and then step six the student will do reflection on the case study okay, so there are six steps uh, for the teachers to follow however uh, this is a guideline you can change whenever you like uh, the basic point is that there should be a case to be investigated there should be an uh, additional information for students to refer. The students should be in a group to have a discussion, and they must and then they must present their um, solution. Uh, should have a feedback discussion and um, an opportunity for the student to do self reflection upon receiving the feedback. So this is one of the example of case study. Okay, who is the best candidate for the job? That is what I would like to do. A situation, ASA is a non-governmental uh, organization that provides life skills and job search skills to unemployed young people. 
and to vulnerable adults in an effort to place them in a job or job training. So make sure that uh, our students read together or they can read aloud together so that they can understand the case being investigated, okay, the case presented. Some of the clients have dropped out of school and most of them have not completed a job training program. So the organization is looking for someone who will provide life skills training for the clients to enable them to organize their daily routines, manage money, manage frustration and conflict. So the person should be able to help clients with their application to find a job. So there are four people uh, that have been shortlisted for the job. In your opinion, who is the best candidate? Read the description and fill the assessment form. That is the task for the students um, to complete. Okay, in their opinion, who is the best candidate? And the teachers provide a description of the candidate. Candidate number one is a trained school teacher who holds a certificate in arts therapy. Candidate number two is a social worker specialized in school. Full social work. Candidate number three, under 30 years old, no much, do not have much experience as a social worker, but has worked in various casual jobs before obtaining a social work degree. Candidate number four, in her 50s, has many years of experience as a social worker, um, and so on. So this is the criteria of that four candidate. The students have to choose, have to make the decision which candidate is the most suitable for the job. They proceed in their discussion and they have to uh, assign points to the candidate that they would like to be, uh, uh, to be recruited by the NGO. So this is uh, assessment form to guide uh, the students in their inquiry, in the process of completing the task. So this is how teachers can guide the discussion. Okay? So provide um, some sort of uh, a form for the students to fill, fill up, okay? However, have to we have to make sure that our teaching strategies is, is congruent or aligned with the student's culture. As we said just now, uh, uh, storytelling, discussion uh, as the best strategies to learn English that is from experts and teachers' point of view. But when we come to the student's point of view, uh, they do not like to have a discussion. So there is an element of cultural influence here, okay? Because we have to know that case-based learning ori originated from the Western region, okay? Western researchers introduced case-based learning. So we should not... Uh, uh, adopt a case-based learning approach bluntly. Okay, we have to make some adjustment because our culture is very different. For example, in low context culture, that is from Western culture, um, they have they are very open to discussion. They allow criticism, but in our culture, high context culture, we are very reserved we promote uh, a strong sense of belonging. We dislike conflict. So how can we promote case-based learning that originates from Western to be, uh, to be appropriate uh, in our Malaysian classroom? Okay, so we have to know our students' culture. Some of the dimension uh, of culture that we need to bear in mind is power distance. Okay, what does it mean by power distance? Power distance means that 
um, the less powerful members of the society accept and expect that power to be distributed unequally. So in societies with large power distance, people accept a hierarchical order. Whereas in societies with low power distance, they strive to equalize the distribution of power. In other words, we in Malaysia, we have a very big power distance score. It means that we accept that there is an unequal distribution of power, meaning that teachers are there as authority have to respect the teacher and the students should follow what teacher say. Okay. That is what happening in the classroom. So Malaysia's course high in terms of power distance and this suggests that Malaysia uh, Malaysian uh, accept power to be distributed unequally among members. What does this mean? Asma said, and well, when we as Malaysian, um, we accept the fact that they, the power is not distributed equally, the so respect must be given to the elders, for they are older, they are, the elders are wiser. So respecting elders would signal not only respect, but also proper upbringing being well-bred and consequently enhanced one's standing in society. So what does this mean uh, in our classroom? So in high power distance country, um, like Malaysia, so we are very, um, we are very comfortable with teacher-centered. If premium on order, we give instruction and the students like instruction. Okay, students expect teachers to initiate communication. Students expect teachers to outline path. And teachers never to be contradicted nor criticized. And effectiveness of learning is a function of excellence of teachers. So how can we make sure that case-based learning uh, and uh, is aligned with the students' cultural background, okay, as they would love to see teachers guide the learning, as they love teachers to give instruction. What's next? Okay, so we have to make sure um, our case-based learning approach uh, balance this um, power distance dimension. And then we have individualism versus collectivism. For individualism dimension, so uh, the individual tends to take care of themselves and their immediate families only. But in collectivism society, they, they are expected to take care of their relative members of a particular uh, in-group for an, an exchange. Uh, loyalty. So when we, so Malaysia is a collectivist society. Okay, why we say Malaysia is a collectivist society? We take care of others. Uh, we take care of our society, and uh, with uh, this pandemic, you can see the slogan um, "Kita jaga kita." So it means that we are very collective. We take care of um, our friends. We take care of our neighbor. Okay. So what does this mean uh, in a classroom? Okay. For collectivist society, students will only speak up. Okay. They will call yeah. upon by the teacher. For example, we said, uh, Ali, can you define what is photosynthesis? Then only Ali will speak. If we said uh, anybody, uh, who will, who can define, who volunteer to define uh, photosynthesis? So there will be a silence moment in our classroom. 
because our culture, we are trained to speak up only when we are called by the teacher. And individuals only speak up in small groups. That is why in case based learning, so we have a small group, okay, to promote interactive discussion and formal harmony in learning situation should be maintained. Meaning that Ali would not have um, an opinion that contradicted with Ahmad. So, because that will jeopardize uh, harmony in the classroom. Okay. Neither teacher nor student should be made to lose face in the Jaga idea. So we have to respect the teacher, we have to respect our friends, and by doing so, um, we are not be able uh, to proceed in a debate. We are not able to criticize the opinion so that uh, to make sure that the teacher or the students, or our friends, uh, do not lose their face. Okay, so menjaga aimukul. That is a very strong cultural influence. Mm. Okay, then so. Uncertainty avoidance. This is the third dimension that influence our uh, students' uh, approach to learning style. Our students, we are very, uh, we, we do not take risk. Okay, we are an uncertainty avoidance society. We like to have a very clear situation. We have we like to receive instruction uh, and prioritize social harmony by avoiding any assertive behavior. Uh, as a result, okay, the, the last sentence, as a result, transmission of knowledge as the most appropriate approach to meet the demands. But this contradicts the case-based learning approach. This is the time when the teachers have to make a balance. Okay? We need to transmit the knowledge and at the same time, we encourage the students to proceed in a, a discussion. Okay? So what does this mean? when our students um, are influenced by the uncertainty avoidance culture. Most of the students, they are very comfortable with structured learning. What the students will learn today, how they are going to learn, what are the assessments, so they are very comfortable with the structure, structured learning. And me, myself, I, I also prefer structured Situation. For example, in a meeting, okay, if the dean said, um, Dr. Farah, can you have a program for international students on um, intercultural festival? So I'll be waiting for the next uh, instruction. So what about the course, the venue, um, the objective, the participants? So so that's me. Okay, I like structured situation, and I believe most Malaysian we like structured situation. And for high uncertainty avoidance um, classroom, teachers are expected to have all the answers. Okay, when students ask questions, the teacher should be able to provide answers. Good teachers use academic language. Students are rewarded for accuracy, meaning that if the student scored uh, A, 100%, so uh, they are giving reward. In comparison to the low uncertainty avoidance society, that is the Western country, students are giving reward or innovative approach for their efforts. We, we, we give reward. Accuracy and teachers feel intellectual disagreement as personal disloyalty. Again, that contradicted with our case based learning principle. Okay. So, how can we conduct 
a case-based learning that meets students' learning needs. So we need to have a culturally responsive case-based learning. Okay, so I hope there is something new that I introduced here today. A culturally responsive case-based learning. As case-based learning originated from Western, we need to make sure that it suits with our culture in Malaysia. So it has to be a culturally responsive case-based learning. What is a culturally responsive case-based learning? It does not only refer to ethnicity, it does not only refer to religion, but it relates to students' life experience. Uh, cultivating an appreciation of diversity, classroom environment that honor and reflect the life of students, uh, take care to incorporate the particular of students' lives, such as pets, names, favorite sports into the lessons. Okay. Why I said we should have a culturally responsive case-based learning. I have conducted um, an international research, okay, and uh, we, the researcher, together with um, the teachers, we plan for a culturally responsive science learning, science lesson plan. Okay, so we are trying to introduce about um, predator and prey. Okay, and one of the one of the song that our researchers suggest is to use Jalil Hamid song that is Ayam. I'm not sure whether you are familiar with the song Ayam, but this researcher is a professor, so he suggests we use that song Ayam by Jalil Hamid. Hmm. Ayam berbagai ayam. Ah, yeah, that, that song, okay. But when it comes to the teachers, the teachers, um, their age is around 24, 25. They're not familiar with that song, okay. And when we implement that song in the classroom uh, with uh, uh, year five uh, students, they, it is an alien song to them. But that is not a culturally responsive song, okay? Next, we try to uh, introduce um, Ibu Ayam di Kerja Musa, that game, okay? Uh, the students from Malacca, uh, they are able to play that game because they know Musa will catch uh, the chicken and, and eat the chicken. However, students in Putrajaya, they, are, they didn't know what is musang and they didn't know musang eat chicken. That is not a culturally responsive uh, example for students in Putrajaya. Okay? So that is why we should have a culturally responsive teaching strategy. So we should have a culturally responsive case-based learning so that it relates, it link, it associate well with the student's life experience. Okay? Don't limit yourself, culture, to only ethnicity. It refers to the student's environment, where the students come from. If the students are from um, rural areas where they are very familiar with uh, jungle, um, then use that kind of situation in your case study. But if the students are very familiar with beaches, uh, so use that kind of environment to proceed with your case-based learning. Okay, so some of the culturally responsive case-based learning for Sarawak context that I can suggest is Sarawak rabies breakout outbreak, okay? So Sarawak is one of the countries in Malaysia that have rabies outbreak. So how to make sure that our students are aware of this, okay? And it will be very related to their life. Okay. Next is river surfing in Sarawak, idle ball. 
Okay, Sarawakian cuisine, Rajang River, Sarawak cultural village, Sarawak uh, Keringkam and Songke. So that is how we can make sure that um, the culture, the background of the students are being considered in our teaching. So why we should have a culturally responsive approaches why we should have a culturally responsive case-based learning because you can see here if we give the same case-based learning um, to our students uh, you can look at the picture on our on your left okay you are being equal you are being fair you give the same treatment you give the same case However, students with this advantage, they will not be able to understand your case. For example, you have a case about uh, four seasons in a year. Those that uh, do not have any uh, information on seasons, uh, they will be left out. Okay? Those that have an advantage, they are able to on that fence, but those that are at this advantage, they are not able to look beyond that fence. Okay, however, if you implement a culturally responsive case-based learning, a case that is uh, based uh, upon the student's local background so we can make sure that these advantage students uh, receive uh, assistance okay? for example in Selangor we have those coming from PPRT uh, flat okay? they haven't go to the beach they do not go for a camping so if you have a case-based learning case on camping so they are at disadvantage okay but if you have a case on for example uh dengue okay, they are familiar with that case uh so they will be able to proceed in their learning better okay so that is equity we give a treatment we give a case that can help these disadvantaged students. So uh, by doing so, we can help all the students to see beyond that fence, okay? However, the reality, what is happening right now at schools, at universities, we give special treatment to those, at, uh, to those with advantage. And those at disadvantage, we leave them uh, we leave them. Okay, not only we give some treatment, but we dig a hole. Okay, so that should not be happening. So make sure uh, the case that you choose relates to the students that are most in need. Okay, case that relate to the student most in need. So with that, um, I leave. Uh, my talk, um, and I maybe I can have some questions, Q and A before we end the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, that was a marvelous sharing from you. I'm very convinced that it has given each of us a clearer insight on what is actually case-based learning. Mm -hmm. I do agree about using a culturally responsive case, best learning towards our students, get a more meaningful and relevant learning, since it's very contextual and people would be uh, would feel the connection and could relate better to the content. Uh, one question from me, I'm sure that this kind of learning would interest and attract our students to experience an out-of-the-box learning style. Since I think this is uh, pretty new for them. Uh, for example, if the kids, uh, they have um, weaker um, skills, I mean, in talking, in, in, in discussion, 
uh, they do aware that they have this uh, the the slightly lower competency. So how could we guide our students to you know to join this kind of learning? Okay, thank you very much, Frida. Uh, in terms of competency in speaking, in reading, in listening, in understanding, um, in a group, um, we have to make sure that uh, we have a mix between students with high level of competency and low level of competency. But before we proceed further with that case-based learning approach, we need uh, to have some rules. Uh, for example, we have to show respect to others. Okay, encourage them to use language and do not bother about uh, the grammar. And if they face difficulty, so um, they can have a mixture of uh, Malay as well as English language. Uh, the key point is for them to practice. If they have an own practice, I, I believe they can improve as um, they can improve themselves as they encounter this case-based learning in the future. So we have to be very persistent. We have uh, to be uh, very determined. Okay, to make sure that uh, the goal of case-based learning that is for, to promote interaction, to promote, uh, to promote, uh, promote uh, the ability to speak between the students at, at the end of our lesson. So be determined. So teachers should never give up. Let them have the opportunity to speak. Hello, my name is Katharina Stephen. I would like to have a question with uh, um, the speaker. Um, hello, Cikgu, good morning. Um, I'm from PPD Suratok. Um, I was a bit late coming in just now because I've had, I have other, other things to matter just now. So, but I would like to ask um, if this case study, um, if, can it be done inside the classroom? Um, can case study be done in classroom? Yes, I, I mean, within uh, within the time frame within the time frame of the teaching and learning. Let's say, for example, within that thirty minutes, can it be done? Yes, it can be done because it's a guided uh, inquiry process. So the teachers should prepare all the materials uh, and have uh, a question for the students to ponder. So that will. Uh, make the process even uh, smoother. So the teacher, the effort from the teacher is very important so that we can have a guided inquiry so we can finish that discussion on time. So I believe it, it, is, it can be done in, within 30 minutes of um, classroom teaching and learning. Yeah, okay, thank you. Because uh, it will um, help me to uh, do my uh, binding on with the teachers because um, in most of the cases that I've seen, teachers are always um, separating the case study or the problem-based learning or the project-based learning. They seem to separate it uh, from the kemahiran that should be covered within the, the, the platform itself. What I mean is that if they are going for the case study, teachers should be able to um, cater the needs of the students based on the skills that is inside the BSKP. Um, that should be highlighted also uh, by, by other speakers, if uh, sorry to say, um, because so that the teachers do not get, uh, uh, what do you call that, a different idea or a different view that it should be like uh, the case study is just one one uh, thing on its own, it should cater for the kemahiran itself. That's why I was asking you just now, but thank you for the clarification. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. and, and um, to make sure that it can be done in 30 minutes, um, the complexity of the case chosen also should be reviewed uh, and it should meet uh, the student's 
uh, readiness for learning. So the complexity of the case as well as the student's readiness should be um, should be at par. Yeah. Hello, Doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, one question from uh, the audience. Okay, yeah. so the question is how to overcome the issue where the people have limited access to the resources and facility? Isn't it unfair if we didn't expose them to the case that they are not familiar with? Uh, because just now, uh, it's all about standing in the reality and focus on the case near them. What about the kids that they uh, that uh, kids that have no ideas about the case? Okay, so um, uh, why we have culturally responsive pedagogy? So we have to look at the root. A case-based, uh, culturally responsive pedagogy is to address the issues of disadvantaged students, underserved students, uh, those with limited uh, experiences. So how to, to, uh, to make sure that they are able to compete uh, or to be at par with their counterparts. So by making sure that they have um, they, their uh, backgrounds uh, were used, were integrated in the lesson. But uh, having said so, uh, we do not limit uh, the, the lesson to only include local uh, knowledge background. We can slowly integrate other background by making sure that the students are ready. Okay, uh, these culturally responsive approaches has been proved very successful in Japan. If you look at Japan, uh, they focuses on what Japan has uh, done today and what Japan can do better. So they do not bother bother about others, but they make sure that um, their local knowledge are being addressed and the students uh, has mastered that knowledge uh, prior to introducing other knowledge. So uh, it's just like um, yang dikendong uh, berciciran yang apa uh, okay, I, I, I forgot about that peribahasa, tapi uh, we have to make sure that the students, the students themselves are ready for other, uh, other knowledge uh, and they have mastered and they are very confi confident and they are very competent in discussing, in uh, their speaking skills before introducing some alien key study for them to proceed further with that discussion. Because I'm afraid if that environment is too alien for them, they would not proceed further. That will be a great uh, wall of barrier for them. Uh, hello, doctor. Hello, hi. Hi, hello. I'm Cheku Piramin from Kuala Lemai. I just have a question to ask uh, pertaining to this uh, case-based study uh, learning. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the appropriate time that we should give a student to carry out a project? Because there should be a time, because it's, since it's a project, there must be a time that the student can carry it out. Um, um, a time for a student to carry it out. Uh, it goes back to your uh, weekly, your yearly lesson plan. So when you want to introduce these skills, you can have it uh, anytime that you like and integrate it with, um, for example, your comprehension or uh, activities. So you can integrate, uh, integrate uh, that case study itself with other subjects, so it just depends on the creativity of the of the teachers when to have that case case um, case based learning. So we do not have any restricted time, but uh, if you are able to to integrate um, 
more than one topic so that would be better because uh, the students will have more engaging discussion uh, for that case. Hi, doctor. Hi, doctor. I am Elizabeth from SK Sungai Bulo. I am 10 years old. My question is, is there any right or wrong answer or solution for the case? A right or wrong uh, answer for what? For the case. For a case, okay. Okay, so we have um, students here. So thank you very much uh, for that questions. Uh, and I'm very happy as you can follow our discussion. Okay, is there any right or wrong answer? Okay, if I ask you, uh, what is the day today? Today is? Monday. Monday. So if you say today is Friday, is it right or wrong? Wrong. Wrong. Okay, so for that kind of question, that is, uh, we have a uh, right or wrong answers. But if I ask your opinion, um, what uh, do uh, in in your opinion uh, is eating nasi lemak healthier than eating uh, roti canai? So what is your opinion? Nasi lemak or roti canai is healthier? Nasi lemak. Okay, so why you said nasi lemak is healthier? Is is tasty. Ah, okay. So for that kind of question, there is no right or wrong answer. So you can say nasi lemak is healthier because you can have protein, you can have carbohydrate. Uh, in comparison to roti canai. But some of your friends might say roti canai is healthier because the calorie is uh, is lower. So it depends on the question asked. So if they ask you about the opinion, if they ask for suggestions, so there is no right or wrong. But if they ask about a factual information, so there is a right or wrong answers. Okay, so... This is one of um, one of the situation. The students, our students, Malaysian students, they are very afraid to make mistakes. Okay, so this is one of the rules also that we can establish prior to having our case based learning, making sure that we accept all answers. Okay, and uh, we are not going to judge that answers. We are going to have a discussion about the answers, and they are free to make any, uh, any or share any opinion. So mistakes is accepted in this case-based learning situation. So have a rule for that, uh, for that kind of situation, okay, so that the students are very happy to share and they are not scared to make mistakes. Okay, thank you, doctor. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, doctor, we have uh, one question. So what is the difference between case-based learning and problem-based learning? Okay, what are the difference? Uh, both they have a, a problem, a case um, to be solved. Okay, this is a similarities. Uh, both are very focused on real life experiences. Um, but um, a, a distinctive difference between case-based and problem-based is that case-based learning uh, proceed in a very guided inquiry process. Guided inquiry process means that the teachers supply the information. The teachers prepare the learning resources. The question come from the teachers and the teachers will guide uh, the discussion as well as the feedback. However, in problem-based learning, the inquiry process is very open, meaning that the students themselves have to proceed in 
uh, gathering the information and this means that longer time is needed for problem-based learning. However, in case-based learning, we can guide the students, we can guide the process to make sure that we can finish our lesson in a very short time of period. But that is a very uh, big difference between case-based learning and problem-based learning. But the, the, uh, the, the distinction, the separation is very blurred. Okay? They share same principles, but uh, one is open inquiry and one is guided inquiry. That is the basic uh, difference between open, uh, between problem-based and case-based learning. So hello, Cikgu. I'm Cikgu Wan Ridwan uh, from PPD Selangau. So I have a question here. Mm -hmm. So how can we ask the student, how, how can we assess the student based on the case? Because as we know, this is a group work, right? Do yeah. we have to assess the student uh, on individual participation or as a whole group? Okay. Um, we, ref uh, we reflect back the purpose of conducting assessment. Okay, uh, why we need that assessment? If we need that assessment to assess the student's competency in uh, pronunciation, uh, then we should have um, an individual assessment. But if we want to assess their ability to cooperate, to collaborate within that group, so we should have um, a group assessment. So we reflect the purpose of our assessment, what we want to do from our assessment. As assessment uh, greatly influenced students' learning. For example, when we said to the students prior to having our case-based learning, okay, after this case-based learning, I'm going to assess your ability to uh, give opinion on blah, blah, blah. Okay, the students will surely proceed in a very interactive discussion, uh, in very immense uh, discussion. But if we say uh, to the students, after this case-based learning, I am going to have an objective assessment of, on your comprehension about uh, this topic, okay, an objective assessment. So the students will pay attention at the details of the case study rather than focusing on having a discussion, a dialogue. So uh, reflect back at what is the focus, what is the purpose of our assessment, then only we can design that assessment strategy. Hello, doctor. Uh, my student would like to ask you one question. Okay. All right, okay. Uh, hello, doctor. My name is Andy. I'm from SK Kuala Pugal. How will it help me as a student, especially during the, this question of the case? Okay, thank you very much. So everybody are having their students by their side by their by their side. So I thought it's the kids or the children. Okay, so thank you very much. How does it help? Okay. So let me share a real life situation. Um I studied in Edinburgh, Scotland. Okay, and I have my friends. Uh he is from Klantan. Okay, and as we know, most Klantanese, they do not speak English well. Okay, they are very shy to speak in English. However, academically, he is a very excellent student. Okay, but he cannot speak in English. But he needs to study in Edinburgh, Scotland. Okay, so when he is put in a place, in a situation where uh, the only way for him to interact is by speaking English, he then um, 
didn't have to try it uh, and overcome his shyness. Uh, and as he communicate with uh, Scottish people, in confidence and and now he's very fluent in English and he is able to complete his PhD written in English. Okay, so that is how case based learning can help you, provides you the opportunity for you to practice English. As we know, we in Malaysia we usually speak our mother tongue. Okay, so by having this case based learning, you are giving you are given the opportunity to practice English. Okay, when you practice English, when you speak, you will get better. So that is why we need case-based learning. It's not just about you being able to read, understand a paragraph or a story, but it is for you uh, to be able to speak, to be able to proceed in a dialogue, with your friends uh, later, if you have the opportunity uh, to study abroad. So it really helps. Okay, so I hope um, this case-based learning approach uh, provide a very supportive environment to the students. It's not um, a threatening environment, but a supportive environment so that they, are, they feel calm, they feel supported to speak in English. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Thank you. All right, Doctor. Uh, I have uh, two, three more questions from the chat box. Okay, I will read you uh, the questions. Okay. Must the people find out solutions to solve the issues in the in the case best learning or just find the related info and discuss about it? Okay, uh, they should come up with a solution. So that is a task to be completed. So uh, we as Malaysian, we usually take the middle uh, the middle solution. For example, if we have um, a Likert scale of one to five, so Malaysian we used to choose number three because we do not want to make any decision. But in this case based learning, you have to make decision. You have to justify your decision or your solution. So is it is a task based learning? So there must be a solution. Another one from Cheikh Gupi Rabin from SK Kuala Lumai. I would like to ask how does case-based learning caters to the need of low proficiency pupils? Yeah. How does the assessment for pupils with, with uh, proficiency be valid and fair? Uh, will the assessment purely be on language aspects alone or will it include EMK that involves other skills such as scientific skills, data collection skills and more? Or does this method suitable only for pupils with higher proficiency? All right, okay. Uh, Case-based learning is, uh, is designed uh, purposely for uh, engaging the students in a discussion. So uh, the purpose is to provide an environment for students to practice English. So, with that, uh, it means that it is tailored for low proficiency students. But how can we make sure that it meets the need of the low proficiency students? The complexity of the case be put at low level so that they can proceed with the discussion. For example, you can have a case uh, about uh, seasonal fruits in Sarawak. So that is, that is quite easy for them to have a discussion. And welcome, um, welcome if they need to speak in their mother language, okay? Encourage them to practice English. Um, so expect them to have um, 
to have uh, a moment of silence in their in their discussion, but provide supporting uh, materials, provide extra learning materials so that they can use uh, when discussing. Okay, so yes, case based learning is for low proficiency students. It is purposely tailored, purposely introduced to make sure that they have opportunity space to practice English. Okay, next, how to make sure assessment is uh, valid and fair. So it comes to uh, assessment validation uh, where uh, we have to uh, know the purpose of our assessment. Okay, so in designing uh, assessment for this kind of uh, teaching approaches, um, it has to be very fluid. It has to be very flexible. So it should not be that objective. For example, one of the assessment that you can use is that uh, prior, before using case-based learning, the students are able to use uh, for like 10 vocabulary on this, this, this. After pro, uh, pro progressing in case-based learning, the students uh, has uh, more vocabulary. For example, the students are able to use this, this, this. So that is a very, uh, that is what we call as ipsative assessment. So you have to know more than formative or summative assessment. You have to use uh, ipsative assessment for this kind of uh, teaching approaches. So what is ipsative assessment? The spelling is I P S A T I V E. So ipsative assessment is a kind of assessment where you assess the student's current uh, current achievement uh, with the student's uh, past achievement. So you are comparing the students themselves, okay, their ability before and after. So that is ipsative assessment. Ipsative assessment is the way to go if you proceed in this case-based learning. Um, I think, uh, should it be uh, assessed only on language uh, alone or scientific skills, uh, data collection? Uh, for English teachers, I believe you should focus on language purposes, language aspect. Uh, for scientific skills, I believe there is a territory for the for science teachers. But if you work together with science teachers to have this case, this learning, then you can have assessment for scientific skills. But if you alone um, focusing on language development, so focus on assessing language aspect. Okay. Right. Any more teachers or students would like to ask questions or share any thoughts about the sharing? Okay, we have one question. How a case best learning considered as su successful? Okay, how it can be considered as successful when it, when it achieve your teaching objective? For example, your teaching objective is for the students to understand uh, pollution and how to reduce uh, uh, greenhouse uh, gas emission. So when the students are able to find the solution for environmental issues, so then you can consider case-based learning to be successful. If you say case-based learning will be successful when the students are able to, uh, to propose or to come up with a poll, so when the students are able to come up with the best poem, then your CBL can be considered as successful. So have your objective, and when your objective is achieved, you can consider it to be successful. Depends on your 
objective of having this CBM. Right, thank you, Doctor. Uh, any more? Any more from teachers or students? How many students do we have here? Yeah, students. I saw so many students today. Why we have students? What are their roles? <laughs> Is there any students want to ask question or share any thoughts? Okay, doctor, one more question. Do the pupils need to implement the solutions? Oh, do the pupils need to implement the solutions? Um, no, because CBL is just uh, to find a solution, not for, it's not the action. So uh, it's a very different, different, it takes a lot of effort if uh, we want the students to implement the solutions. But that is very, that is a very interesting suggestion. Only that it has to be done outside of the classroom, maybe as a project, um, a year-end project maybe, uh, so that the students are engaged with the, the teachers and the, the friends during the during the holiday. It is very a very a very good suggestion. All right. Hello. What a wonderful sharing. Uh, oh, check the one uh, one is it? Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, this is not a question, but this is more like a, a brief summary based on what uh, Doctor No Fadila has said just now. So basically the uh, teacher's role is more like they have to help the student find the issue based on the case. And then they have to find the causes, the factor. And lastly, they have to find the intervention on how to solve the case. Is it right? Yeah, yes, correct. So, so the role of the teacher is to help the student. So the role of the student uh, is to present the, uh, the case based on the issue, causes, factor, and intervention. Is it right? Yes, 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 correct. Okay, just to give the brief, uh, I know, brief summary on what they have, uh, what teacher, uh, what are the teacher's role on what they're going to do with case-based learning. All right, okay, thank you very That's much. Okay. Thank you very much, Wan Rizwan. One question from Cikgu Katarina. Mm -hmm. How do teachers assess case-based learning? Are there any specified or set standardized instrument? No, we don't have any standardized instrument uh, because it really depends on the case, on the objective, on the student's readiness, uh, and on what the purpose of the assessment. But uh, I would like to suggest that uh, for you to look further into Ipsen assessment it really helps to go beyond than what we already practice in assessment so have a look at positive assessment it helps it helps um, to go beyond our standardized uh, assessment because this based learning is not for uh, our our teacher centered approach so it you can, uh, at the moment, when you implement case-based learning to empower students to be the assessors of themselves. That is why we have case-based learning. We want the students to be self-reflective, self-reflection, self-assessors, so the students themselves can assess uh, their learning. So in case-based learning, the assessment is very open. Okay, um, the students, uh, have uh, the the opportunity to be the assessors themselves um, so that is the nature of case based learning but when it implement, when it is being implemented in formal classroom so we have to refer to ppd if they have any um, specified or standardized instrument but as what researchers uh, introduce we do not have any strict um, uh, instrument Okay, to be associated with CBL. It depends on how the teachers 
uh, going to assess the student's learning. Uh, hello, doctor. Hello, hi. Uh, doctor, um, I think this uh, case-based learning is such a wonderful thing to be carried out in the classroom because it gives teacher the uh, anatomy to the autonomy to carry out and decide the assessment that they want to give to their kids. Uh, should kids be uh, should we tell kids that what are they supposed to be assessed on before they start on the project? Like so, they have a clear view that okay, this is what I'm going to assess you and this is what you focus on um, and how the way you carry out your project you'll be, uh, will be assessed through this criteria. Is that a correct way to do it? Yes. Uh, if I am that student, if I am your student, I would be very lovely if you said, uh, if you explicitly discuss with me um, the rubric uh, and the assessment approach that you will use because I will tell it uh, my learning approach towards that assessment strategy. I will make sure that what I do will make uh, be scored um, high in your assessment uh, practices. So yes, I believe the students, they will and they want to know um, how the teachers assess, okay? If uh, we were at um, the university ourselves, the lecturers also will say, okay, this is your assignment. I will assess you on this, this, this. So it really helps the students on how to make sure that um, they perform to what teachers expected. So, yeah, that is the correct way. Make sure that you explicitly discuss with them, tell them what you are going to assess. All right, everyone. Thank you, doctor. Oh. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Piravin. Okay. All right, everyone. Uh, I will end our question session.